calling this one metabolic transformation. Don Lehman. Don, let's start right at the top. As we talked about, you were you started to uh, t- talk about the why and all of the macros that go into protein and all of your research. Let's just start right at the beginning. We got a good six minutes to go in this segment. I want to give you plenty of time to talk about this. We can continue this through, but the why, why do people need to know more about what you know? Well, like I said earlier, you know, I think that muscle and brain are the two tissues that we have to protect for healthy aging. And early in my career, when I started studying muscle, I realized that It's the one tissue we really have control over. We can control its metabolism because of activity. And I also realized that it makes up 50% of our body protein. And that's a really very expensive part of our diet. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of protein to maintain that. And so, you know, I just sort of narrowed in on that. I focused on it. And the more I studied it, the more I realized it was really the center of how we metabolize blood sugar, you know, you know, how do we become insulin insensitive? Why do we become diabetic? It's how we metabolize uh, fats. So why do we have high fats in our blood? Muscle is really the center for all of that. And if muscle's not healthy, that's when you start getting these problems, whether it's high blood lipids that lead to heart disease or high blood sugars that lead to diabetes or just high calories, you know, too many calories that lead to obesity. So muscle really is the center of really all of our adult health problems that everybody talks about. And, and people, you know, try to focus on, well, it's about body fat. How do I get rid of fat? Or it's about heart disease. How do I make you know my heart help? It's not about those things. It's how do you keep the muscle healthy and then everything else falls into place. So we've really got it backwards. My colleague, you mentioned Dr. Gabrielle Lyons, uh, says that you know one of her comments is usually that you know, we've got it all wrong. It's not an obesity epidemic, it's an epidemic of being under-muscled. And we just don't have healthy muscles. To, you talked you about the carbs and the snacking and how the snacking was really the what culprit. I got a minute and a half to go. Can you kind of finish that thought and uh, talk about that and, and, and part of the why with, with all the snacking that's going on? Yeah, I, I, I mean, to just focus on that part of it, one of the things we've done is look at how why people are overeating. And one of the things we know is that Americans are social eaters. We eat because it's breakfast time or lunch time or dinner time. Uh, and for the most part, we're reasonably consistent about that. But the real unknown out there is snacking. And people believe that they should have a mid-morning snack or they believe at mid-afternoon or they should sit in front of the TV at night. And a lot of the appetite regulation data shows that it's really this snacking outside of meals that causes the excess calories that leads to obesity. So that's one very serious part of the obesity question. And, And one of the things by having a higher protein, lower carbohydrate diet is you're less prone to snacking. And so the appetite regulation becomes much better. So that's that's one of the underpinning part of the whole metabolic transformation that we try to create. And so right, let me read please that. let's let's talk about it. Go into uh, that muscle centric age related issue and however you want to describe this. Let's take a couple of tracks on it. One, uh, I mentioned that I started my research doing some aging research. And for years, we've known that as we get older, Uh, our rate of protein turnover, our rate of making new protein declines with age. And we always thought that was an inevitable part of aging. But around the turn of the century, around 2000, discoveries in my lab and a couple of other labs, we realized that in older individuals, it really wasn't that they lost the capacity for protein synthesis, it's just that the efficiency went down. And so what we now know is that We always thought about children needing more protein, but it turns out because of this efficiency issue, older adults actually are the ones who need more protein, that the efficiency of handling it goes down. And so our needs for both quantity and quality goes up. And so I think that's a a learning for people is that that we've always sort of had the idea, well, I'm an adult, I'm not growing, I really don't need as much. In fact, you'd probably need more. And so that's a first piece of information. Another sort of pet peeve of mine is we've always addressed the macronutrients as a, what should you avoid? 
uh, it's always has been, well, cholesterol or saturated fat, or those are actually all nonsense. Uh, the issue is how do you balance calories against protein? So when you start thinking about your diet, the first thought you should have is what level of protein am I going to have? If I'm going to be an athlete and I want a higher protein diet, should I have 150 grams per day or 200 grams per day? Make a decision. If I want to be a vegetarian and I'm only going to eat 65 grams per day, that's a decision. Then the diet and lifestyle have to build, be built around it. So when I hear people say, well, protein is a percentage of calories, I mean, that's really dumb. I mean, there's no real logic to that. In fact, if it's a percentage of calories, it's inverse. Your higher your calorie intake, the lower the percentage. Or to put it differently, if you're a 70-year-old female only eating 18, you know, 1,400 calories per day, your protein probably should be 30, 35% of it because your protein requirement is the same as it was when you were 25. And so people don't get that. So when I was at the University of Illinois and working with the protein, we were focused on, you know, how to be healthy adults. One of the aspects is, you know, as we get older, we all tend to lose some muscle mass. We, we sort of understood some of the mechanisms for that. Unfortunately, to study that aging is you lose about five to 8% muscle mass per decade. And as a researcher, that's really hard to study. Uh, most of our techniques require about a 10% change to pick it up. And so that means you have to outlive your subjects. You know, you can't study it long enough. And so we started thinking about other conditions and weight loss was the one we thought, okay, here's a condition, as you mentioned, if you just go out and do a crash diet, somewhere between 35 and 50% of your weight loss will be muscle mass. It's a huge loss. And that's why people who lose weight will regain it so quickly is that they're actually deteriorating their long-term body health by doing these yo-yo type diets. And so we said, well, if we correct that with protein and the diet, get the macros right and use exercise, we did some exercise studies, can we change that? And what we showed is we could take from people who were just following the food guide pyramid, following exactly what the dietary guideline, they were losing 35, 36% of their muscle, of their lean body mass during weight loss. We could drop that down to 6%, which is probably about the minimum you'd ever lose just by doing the right amount of protein and exercise. So that, that was kind of the issue. And this discrepancy have, that we have in the world, everybody, plant versus animal. Don, you want to take 30 seconds to talk about and set that up about the difference between the plant and animal. Could that give you a couple seconds to talk about that, please? Sure. Um, and, and in fact, I just put out a, a statement on Twitter this morning on that exact topic. But um, basically, uh, we have this push for a more plant-based diet. And there's some risk to that. You know, I think every nutritionist would say, you know, eating more broccoli and green beans is great. But right now, Americans have 70% of their calories coming from plant-based calories now, and it's really crappy. You know, it's basically refined sugars, uh, it's refined grains, it's processed oils and things like that. So uh, what we know for 100% fact is that animal proteins have higher quality than all plant proteins. So if you shift to a more plant-based diet, you have to recognize you're going to eat more total protein more total calories to be equal. And so that's a real risk for most adults who don't need calories. The, the plant versus animal for protein, like I said earlier, the animal proteins always have higher quality. When we look at actual protein requirement, protein is simply a food. I like to use the analogy, it's like a vitamin pill. We don't talk about the color and shape or digestibility of the pill, we talk about the 14 vitamins inside of it. And that's really all protein is. Protein is a food delivery system for amino acids. And if we look at our actual requirement, we have an absolute, absolute requirement for nine, what we call essential amino acids. There are 20 amino acids in our body and nine of them we have to get in the diet on a daily basis. And then we have what we call sort of non-specific amino acids or nitrogen. So those are the two parts. The, the nine essential amino acids 
are kind of hidden in the protein name. And what we know is that in every animal protein, those nine are in the right balance. They're in the right balance for humans because animals and humans have similar balance. In plants, the amino acids are there, but they're in the balance for the plant. The plants is growing flowers and seeds and roots and stems, which are pretty different than brains and hearts and legs and arms. And so, you know, the, the plant proteins are there. And the other pro problem with it is 50% of the amino acids in a plant are bound to the fiber, which we can't digest. And so they're not available. We call it the bioavailability. So plants have two strikes. One is that the protein's not very available. And the other is that the amino acids are not in the right ratio. And so we actually have evolved as humans to use animals to correct that ratio. We can get it by eating plants, but you have to eat more calories and more uh, total protein. Uh, for example, you can eat, uh, if you're thinking about something like quinoa versus say something like a whey protein, a dairy protein, uh, you can stimulate your muscle protein synthesis with 25 grams of whey protein, but it takes to get the same level of uh, leucine, the critical amino acid, it takes seven and a half cups of quinoa. And so it just physically, you can't eat it. It's, you know, it's the difference between uh, having uh, 300 calories or having uh, 4,000. You know, it just, it's just not a, a comparison. The, the issue with plants is they're great. They tend to be great, you know, beans, nuts, lentils, things like that are great food sources but they actually should be considered great carbohydrate sources in your diet that actually provide good protein. To just shift your protein all to those plant sources, it's hard to eat enough volume or enough calories to make it work. So that, you know, that's what people need. And I could give you a couple of examples. Think about a wheat cereal. A typical wheat cereal will say a serving is a cup and it will have about four grams of wheat protein in it. Okay, wheat protein is only about half digested, but we'll go with the four. You then look at it says, okay, combine that with six ounces of milk. You now have 10 ounces total. And it turns out that that is exactly a balanced essential amino acid, a wheat protein with a cow's milk. And now people are saying, well, how about if I use plant-based? So how about if I use soy? Well, now if you look, soy and wheat are deficient in the same amino acids. And so to make that a balanced breakfast, you need to have 25 to 30 ounces of soy milk to balance. And if you go to almond milk, it's over 50 ounces. So how many mothers out there giving their child a wheat cereal are choosing between six ounces of milk or 30 ounces of soy milk as the choice? I mean, that's the kind of practical information the public needs to understand about making plant-based choices.